I would like to introduce the first speaker, Ms. Shruti Sena from Chintan. A brief introduction. Shruti Sena leads policy and outreach at Chintan Environmental Research and Action Group and works on efforts to reduce plastics in India, secure livelihoods and concerns of waste workers and push towards sustainable and circular consumption. Equipped with a dual degree in international affairs and history from Columbia University and London School of Economics, and with some years of work experience in policy advocacy and research, she is intent on taking strong steps towards mitigating climate change in India. A linear economy culture that stresses on increased and fast consumption has led to a waste overflow crisis. The overflow of waste is linked to climate change and calls for urgent action at national, local, and individual levels. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Shruti Sanna. The floor is yours. Hello. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Rahul. Um, so the the issue or the agenda that I have to speak about is e-waste. And then I spent a lot of time thinking about e-waste also because um, the whole arena of environment and climate is something that is that, that I have now started delving into and now started really studying in a very uh, comprehensive manner. And uh, the one thing that keeps coming up is e-waste. So in fact, that was one of the first, um, I remember uh, around my, some of them around my first days in Chintan, um, e-waste was something that was um, a big discussion with an international network. So, um, so what is e-waste? So um, very simply put, it's all end of life and discarded electronic waste. Um, and these are also whole in part, whole or in parts. And this can be say a microwave or air conditioner or computer or computer hardware, uh, fluorescent lamps. Um, but what is important is that all of this is without the intent of reuse. So there is no intent of reuse, which is why it's e-waste. Um, it's important to note, I'm going to keep this quite fact-based to begin with. Uh, one of the fastest growing waste streams that is e-waste. And this is both in the developed and the developing world. Um, if I had to give you numbers, in 2021, 52.2 million tons of e-waste was uh, produced globally. In India, um, in the year 2019-2020, uh, the production was 10 lakh plus tons of e-waste. And India happens to now be the second largest generator of e-waste, which is following China. So e-waste is very different from other kinds of waste. And in fact, it falls into the hazardous waste category. So um, why, why it's hazardous is basically, firstly, it has health hazards, uh, which means hazard if you have direct contact with it, and B, if you inhale toxic fumes that come from it, or if you have any sort of contact with it, including say, if the chemicals seep into the ground or into the soil or into the water. So it's hazardous in those ways. And this is because there are many chemicals involved in the making of um, electronics as we know. So to give you some examples, candium, which is found in printers and toners, um, these are, the, this chemical causes um, bone, ca bone cancer and bone related infections. Um, mercury or lead, which is in batteries, uh, causes brain, brain damage in children and children are particularly vulnerable to um, these kinds of chemicals. Um, and I will come to children later as well. Um, so, um, so then dealing with e-waste is 
very different from dealing with any kind of solid waste, which you can say even send to a landfill or it's, it's not as simple as sending it to a landfill basically. Uh, so there is a specialized treatment around it. Now in terms of, and because I'm talking say in specifically in context of India, there are laws and there were certain rules that came in 2008. There was the hazardous waste management rule that came uh, and was updated around 2016. And so there are laws in place which discuss, um, albeit not in a very great manner, but still discuss managing and handling of e-waste. Uh, but a recent CAG report found that 75% states in India have failed to implement the rules. Um, why, again, this is important is because um, there is a whole informal sector around managing uh, or when I say managing, it means uh, both the disposal as well as the recycling of e-waste. About 95% of the e-waste in India, for instance, is managed by the informal sector. Um, so, um, and as we know that informal sector is, is not say under the purview or have, it does, it's not in the purview, but it also does not have the benefits or the equipment or the necessary um, material. I won't say skills because I'll come to that later again, but the material or the formal procedures that come with being involved in uh, dealing with e-waste from a formal uh, economy, from formal sector standpoint. Um, so, so again, that's one thing. The other, the other part that I want to talk about is um, how, uh, so, so Chintan, uh, our organization for one, has been, since 2006, we have been working with uh, e-waste. I thought I would talk about some of the initiatives we've taken because we have, from the beginning, been involved in the debate or the discussion around e-waste, uh, which is, for a long time, e-waste was, we, we would say that, and it still happens, it's still very much a part of this whole process. We say that uh, a lot of illegal dumping happens uh, from the West. So there's a lot of flow from the West to the East, mostly because apparently the West does not have the equipment or they don't have the labor which is willing to work with e-waste. So there's a lot of West to East uh, direction uh, dumping of e-waste. So th th those may be computers and especially, yeah, especially computers uh, and other kinds of like cooling electronics. Uh, are dumped in India. So, um, but that's one, one bit of it. But now India itself has been generating, as I said, it's the second largest generator now of EV. So it, it's no more, not, it is, it is very much a international transfer problem, but it's also a domestic problem now. So, um, so since 2006, uh, Chintan has been an e-waste e collection center with the uh, DPCC, that's the Delhi Pollution um, Control Committee. So and so, what we do is we 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 are involved in collecting e-waste uh, that is generated. We work with it. We um, recycle that waste and. Um, and again, when I come to recycling, that's his, its own. It, it's a it's quite a hazardous process in itself. So um, so we are we are now involved in that. But when I talk about recycling, now what happens is recycling is a big part of how this waste is managed. And so, for instance, if you want to take out gold um, from um, or, or even copper from, say, a metallic or an e-waste substance, uh, you use cyanide, which is, as we know, is one of the most dangerous elements around. So, um, and, and it's not used by the formal sector, um, and it's used, used mostly by the informal sector. So there are certain, certain so, the, so, so the linkage of poverty and hazardous work comes in here, because it's easy to say that why then don't use cyanide for this work, but well, they don't have an option. They, these are people, this is a whole cycle of power poverty. It's a way for people to come out of poverty, get uh, to earn that money, be involved, even the, the, the material that is illegally dumped, they will take it up because well, it's, it's a way to get, generate income. So, um, 
so there's this whole uh, informal formal divide where the formal sectors will be like okay the informal sector is not skilled whereas our research has found that they're highly skilled people but they don't have the formal procedures around it so so that's one thing um then um, i want to bring in the aspect of children because even though child labor in india is banned we have found that um a lot of um e-waste workers involve children from the age of 11 to 16 in uh, e-waste work and this is again for the children as well this is a way to earn income for their families so um so bearing all this in mind um what we do is of course we are an e-waste collection center but uh, and we work with e-waste but our effort has been to train waste pickers and waste recyclers and e-waste pickers and e-waste re recyclers in a way that their jobs um, where they earn money from e-waste is not the income is not lost but we train them in a way that they they can make their jobs greener uh, reduce the hazard that it creates for them and also reduce the pollution that is generated because Again, e-waste is also connected to uh, pollution and climate and pollution, as we know, is connected to climate change. So it's it's all a, it seems micro, but it's connected to the whole macro element of climate change as well. So um, that's so and that's one that's one of our works. We, we are involved in training e-waste workers, recyclers, raising awareness around the hazards, telling them simple ways in which they can deal with the waste. Um, in a way that it does not impact their health. Uh, the other work is to ensure that there are no children involved in the process. We, what we try to do is we run a program where we try to get children working in the waste sector to, um, we try to get them out, put them in schools and, and focus on getting them educated. So that's one of our biggest initiatives and missions action as well. So get, getting children out of the process. So, so that's how the uh, former sector can sort of collaborate. We try to talk to bulk generators. We try to partner with them so that That are informed to streamline them in 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 a way that they. Uh, I mean, if there are any questions. If this. If if there are questions later, I could take them then. Yeah. Uh, Rahul is uh, having to take questions together. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, Hello.
Ma'am, I request you to unmute. Please try, ma'am. Uh, please try, ma'am. Now you can. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me, Anand Sprouts, FES, all of you, and for being here. Uh, may I please uh, share my screen? So, I'd like to make a quick presentation, if I may. Um, can I share my screen? Can you allow me to share my screen? Yes, ma'am, you can. If you're the host, you can share your screen. I don't think I am. Uh, she is. Uh, you can just directly go and uh, click, on click on share, share screen. screen. It should okay work. Can you see? You have to maximize it. Yeah, I'll do that. But can you see? It? Yes, we can. Um. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about noise pollution. We talked a bit about urban issues in one of the breakout groups, but this is specifically about one of the most serious issues that faces pollutants that faces Indian cities in particular, but which we don't know much about. So noise pollution, what is noise pollution and why should we care? So this year for the very first time, the World Health Organization organized a World Hearing Day. And they talked of many things, but among other things, they talked about hearing, the need to have hearing checks at birth, just like you have eye checks at birth. And they talked also about their app, which is a free download where anybody can check their own hearing and discover whether noise pollution has impacted your hearing living in a noisy city or not. The World Health Organization also let us have this data, which you can see that of all the countries in the world, the section around India is the darkest red. And it's the darkest red because it has the highest numbers of hearing disabled people. And that's because of noise pollution. You can see that 430 million people globally uh, require rehabilitation services for hearing loss. And the number is only going to increase. The, uh, at that time, Union Health Minister, Dr. Harshwardhan, was presiding over this meeting and he said, India faces an impending mountain of hearing loss. And this mountain of hearing loss comes about for a reason. It's not that at random Indians are face hearing loss. They face hearing loss because we are exposed to those things which create hearing loss. I spoke about preventive disability. Uh, so this is prevention of disability. What is noise pollution and why is it such a serious issue? I think this is something we need to understand first. And to understand that we need to come to know what are the decibel levels in our city and what are safe limits? This is the decibel level 123.2 at a festival in Mumbai at a street festival. The World Health Organization tells us that if you cross 125, you can have hearing loss in seconds. And 123.2 is just about pushing that boundary. This is using loudspeakers. There are other types of noise in Mumbai which actually do cross that boundary, but we'll come to that. So why did I take up? Noise. in the road rage that surrounds us, in the fights that break out in trains. But that's not all. Honking that horn is hurting your heart because it increases your blood pressure. And consultant cardiologist, Dr. Altaf Patel says that it causes increase in stress hormones again, which increases blood pressure and has adverse effects on the internal lining of the heart arteries, straining the heart. Heart attacks can occur from exposure to sudden loud noise. 
And although that that's, you know, that's what they have said formally, there are other doctors who tell us that because noise is a vibration, it affects every single organ of your body and can also cause cancer. So what are the sources of noise? Vehicular traffic around hospitals. These are the decibel levels. I measured noise in Mumbai and in London and compared them uh, some years ago. I found that the lowest noise levels around a hospital in Mumbai was higher than the highest, highest noise levels around a hospital in London. And that's because the, it's not only festivals, but it's traffic, which is the most serious long-term source of noise and honking. Silent zones are supposed to be areas which surround our hospitals, educational institutes, courts, and religious places. And the reason for this is that these are the areas which require silence so that people can perform well in whatever state they are in, whether it's because of health or because they need to learn or because they need to pray or whatever else it may be. So traffic is the first of these. Um, I started, when I started working on noise, I started with two things. One was court, because we have something called public interest litigation in India, which allows us ordinary people to intervene and get court orders to control things. But then there was a question also after getting the court order of implementation, because implementation is always the problem. So how do you implement? The first is that you need data. There was no data at all on noise pollution when I started in 2002 and three. So you gather data and this is kind of gathering data about traffic. So traffic is not only road traffic, it's also railways. So the, the, the honking from roads, the honking from railways, the announcements on railway platforms, the noise inside the railway carriage, which people are exposed to for a long period of time. Aviation, there were proposals to set up helipads on building rooftops, which we went to court and uh, got them stopped because we measured noise around existing helipads and airports and the people who lived there really, really suffered. I didn't, I mean, the court agreed and the ministry agreed that it was not necessary to have more. Construction, the, the construction of the metro railway line is something where people complained repeatedly because it went on all night. It was at extremely high decibel levels. You can see 110 decibel levels from construction. Firecrackers, I spoke of the, the noise levels which exceed even 125. When we started measuring firecrackers with the pollution control board, which we are doing here in this picture, 100% of firecrackers violated maximum permissible decibel levels which of 125, they went up even to 140. With doing tests every year since 2004, the decibel levels have gone down of the way the crackers are manufactured themselves. It's not yet enough, but at least it's a change. Festivals, all um, festivals of all types and birthday parties and cricket matches and every other kind of celebration gives you these very, very high decibels. But what's the law? What, does it, what are we actually allowed to be exposed to? The Indian law is based on the World Health Organization recommendations, which say that they should, you can see how low the levels are. In a residential area in the daytime, they should not exceed 55 dB. And that's the level beyond which the health effects start catching up with us. But from traffic in Mumbai, it's hardly ever under 80 dB or 85 dB. And you can see that to be heard over and above that, all other types of noise are much more. So what do you do? You need to, we talk again of stakeholders. You need to involve all stakeholders, but the very first starting point of the stakeholders is we, us. So it's people who generated the noise and it's we who did the tests to tell the enforcement authorities that they themselves were suffering. They're not just the enforcement authorities, but them who stand on the road and direct traffic in this test that we did of Mumbai traffic police, a random sample, we found more than 70% of traffic constables on the road had disabling hearing loss, which is a serious, serious issue for them, if not for us. And this is last month when I conducted a training program for Mumbai police constables to explain to them and teach them why they should be taking action against noise. It's not just because it's a textbook law, but because it's creating serious health problems for themselves and for others. Education, 
uh, across all types of colleges, schools, um, underprivileged children, everybody, everyone needs to know what is noise. And it's because of the children teaching their parents that Mumbai was the only city in the country where firecracker use actually, uh, the noise levels were within very low levels and have been reducing since 2016. We also tested hearing of these children at the B BDD Chol. Um, we found that they were the children were very, very receptive to hearing why they should teach their parents that they don't want to hear noise. And that's children are some of the most immediately affected. So you also need other stakeholders, the enforcement authorities, the police. This is the commissioner of police. We released the horn flu with them. You, and of course, to win the battle, one has to be neutral. You can't be, you can't take sides. Noise pollution is a health issue. It's a civic issue. All our bodies are the same. We, wherever we come from, and each of us needs to start with ourselves if we need to control an issue like this. It's not a question of pehle aap, it's a question of pehle mein. So noise from traffic, the, during lockdown was a very good chance for us to figure out what kind of noise levels we, can, we do have and what we should have. So pre-lockdown, there were 105 upwards from traffic. The lowest noise levels in the early lockdown period went immediately down to 52.4, which you can see uh, what a great difference. And then now the measures have been starting to go up again, and you can see that they're slowly going up. In fact, I'm saying yesterday in this slide, but I think this yesterday was a little time ago, and actually now it's back up to 105. So what else can you do? You create awareness with the authorities. We did the first No Horn Day in 2008 with the Mumbai Traffic Police. This is something I presented to them in appreciation. Many No Horn Days have been held. We talked of the role of the media who have played a huge role in reaching out to people and explaining to them why they should not have make noise. This is a three month campaign we did with the Times of India on no honking. Uh, we had some of the first conferences on noise pollution, which was attended by the Director General of Police and senior government officers, which led them to do many things. We joined hands with the Indian Medical Association so that the doctors could take up these kind of tests that we did initially, and they've done them all across the country now. And you know, a consultant doctor telling you about noise pollution makes a huge difference. Urban planning, noise barriers were put up after it became clear that uh, people was really suffering from noise. And we found that they did make a huge difference in, uh, and you know, the development control rules were amended to have noise barriers across all new flyovers. People's participation, people asked me, aren't you afraid? to go out and take readings, but you can see everybody is concerned about their own health. They want to take care of their own health. The government of Maharashtra declared no honking year in 2018. And this is a campaign we did called Horn Vrat, where everyone took oaths not to honk. Again, horn flew with, the, uh, with a different commissioner of police. Children, senior citizens, uh, gods are against noise. Every religion tells us that we need to attain nirvana or moksha or shanti or whatever else you may want to call it. No religion tells us that we need to make noise. And this is true of all. All religions prescribe peace. And so people getting involved, giving them a tool, giving them something they can do. This is a free download on your phone. You can measure noise levels. You can complain to the police on Twitter. In fact, people's participation has made the police set up their systems. Was it easy? No, uh, it wasn't easy. But it's our difficult challenges which are most rewarding and they can be done. Mumbai was the only city in which noise during the entire festival season actually has been reducing year after year, despite not having complete bans on firecrackers, cities which did have these bans could not uh, achieve what Mumbai did. And this is a poster that the Mumbai police put up. Thank you, Mumbai cars, for choosing diaz over crackers. It's time for action. All awareness is great. I'm glad the police are doing the awareness campaigns. I'm glad citizens are participating. We need action against honking, against every type of noise. And we all need to have that action enforcement. We need to, to do this together. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.
thank you sumaira ji for such a lovely talk i hope i'm sure the participants must have enjoyed it as well i apologize i uh, blinked out for a few seconds earlier for those uh, some of you must have interacted with sumaira ma'am uh, during the yin yang sessions but for those uh, who did not i would like to introduce uh, her to you all uh, sumaira abdul ali is a multi award winning environmentalist who is especially known for her work against noise pollution a serious but under recognized health hazard and environmental pollutant in mumbai one of the noisiest cities in the world and her work in illegal sand mining against illegal sand mining another under recognized environment crisis which aggravates the effects of climate change over two decades she has brought these and other lesser known environmental issues to public awareness through strategies including public interest litigation awareness advocacy primary data generation noise pollution is a lesser known but serious health hazard and environmental pollutant which law enforcement agencies typically do not take seriously mumbai which is one of the noisiest cities in the world has led the citizen driven anti noise pollution movement in india lessons learned may be shared to make ground level change not only in india but all over the world where noise remains an unaddressed health and environmental hazard with this i would like to open the floor for questions i would like to Uh, so, uh, uh, as a part of the extension of the introduction of Sumaira Abdulali, I would like to add two bits of more information. One that we've been a long-term associate with Awaz Foundation and have been a part of the Awaz Band campaign and several other, uh, you know, uh, idea ideation and processes. Uh, but uh, today is twelfth of November, as I mentioned earlier, and one cannot forget uh, to mention Dr. Salim Ali. who is the great bird man of india and it is his birth anniversary today so and sumer abdul ali is her is his uh, from his family uh, and her father uh, uh, sorry her father in law uh, humayun abdul ali who was sort of the mentor and trainer of dr salim ali uh, has formulated some of the most foremost laws in this country for wildlife conservation uh, whether it is sanjay gandhi national park formation or be you know bnh as the bombay natural history society Uh, being, you know, he was uh, really instrumental in giving it global acclaim with his research work. So, and Subhara Abdul Ali's mother is probably one of the foremost uh, pilots, lady pilots of India. So she comes from a long line of people who've been influential and uh, have done great work to this, uh, you know, for this country. So thank you, Subhara, on that. Uh, I have a question Anand. here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Anand. I mean, thank you. no i think we need to have positive role models uh, in all genders in uh, all uh, parts of society uh, and this is one of the uh, ideas that this conference is about that uh, everybody's voice and everybody's opinion is very important and even a single person can bring about a big change and you are sort of the beacon of that uh, you know sign in that manner Uh, so yeah, if I'll take the first question, which is uh, from Purnima Purnima Palekar, that is to uh, the first speaker. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 So her question was regarding e-waste. What happens to the waste that is not recyclable and uh, to, has to be disposed of? Do you, do you neutralize the threat uh, it poses to the soil, environment, etc., or maybe do, do you wash the cyanide uh, that is used? Okay. I am actually facing. Uh, I don't think I could hear it, so I am just going to. Uh, just one second. I the basic question I'm just is going to read the moment. question myself, and I'm going to non non recyclable uh, waste, which has 
hazardous materials like cyanide how do you handle them all right got it okay now and then i read the question i read the question so um i think do we have two minutes for this question because i'm just going to um we have i'm going to ask our trainer to answer this because uh, she'll be the best to answer this question i'll answer it last maybe if there are more questions for uh miss miss abdul ali then we could come to this or if there are more evs questions till then i could answer them this is a little technical so i'm just going to um ask our trainer to do it would she be doing it right away we can start uh, take her right away can i uh, ask a question yes yeah so what we see is um every one year or two year our smartphones are going redundant and they become slow uh, and i see the companies promoting this kind of practices is after two years there your iphone doesn't get updated or you have to get uh pay more money for it uh uh this how can we stop or cope with this kind of unhealthy practices so uh, to be clear you want to know about the unhealthy practices around so there's this term called purposeful uh, obsolescence which is um, very much connected to consumption so it says that um, for example if there are iphones um, and smartphones so if you see people are buying iphone one after another and uh, there is a new model every time so um, so the answer lies in a linear versus a circular economy model so um, for example the way we we consume now um, there are for, there, there are say for example the corporates benefit out of us having to buy again and again from them and there's with that comes a culture of consumption that is sort of saying that if you consume more if you buy more and i think it applies to almost all kinds of um all kinds of uh, consumptions that is all kinds of things that we consume that if you buy more i mean it it's it's supported it's it's the i'm not going to take political stance but it's the um backbone of a capitalist framework that you consume more and more and um so so connecting it to that so so the whole idea of a repair economy is something that is again a very much a informal sector thing repair economy is not as much a formalized procedure at all so it it becomes about what we want to mainstream and how we mainstream these ideas of repair economies or consumption that is um more towards repair and circular economies and using the waste and reusing the waste and using um items for a longer period of time does that answer your question i think that's what i got out of your question yeah it's insightful uh, so uh, my concern is more towards like my phone is uh, uh, if an android phone is becoming slower after 2 years uh, i don't know if, I, i'm not sure if it is Uh, it is made that way uh, so that the person buys another phone after two years. So we try, we get that uh, thing to change our phone after two years. It's, it's not working well. Yeah. So is it designed that way, or uh, it could be repaired, or we can give it to some other person who might not need uh, those features and just the basic features and all. Absolutely. The so again, um, definitely as I said, yes. i think uh, there is a second question which can combine with this and we can answer it together okay uh, so i think you know I, and i would like to also po po pose it to sumara on this uh, mm -hmm. one is about the new age of the green vehicles which is coming so mm -hmm. when we we're talking of the battery uh, into waste uh, you know into the consideration as well as the other aspects of it how green are really these vehicles that we're talking about so uh, with the e waste i'm uh, there's a question which is related to green vehicles also so either of you all can take it up uh, about that aspect you're on mute you're on mute um if you would like me to talk about green vehicles that means the electrical vehicles i think you can talk about so electrical vehicles according to the united nations is 
one of the primary goals of this COP that 26, which is being held, because it is supposed to reduce the uh, emissions from fuel, which it does. So study after study has shown that if EVs are used, they do reduce the emissions from the normal petrol diesel cars that we use. The problem with EVs is not that, that it, theoretically they're wonderful, but even in other countries, EVs have not really been able to take over a huge market share. Um, I'm a firm believer that India can do many things which other countries can't because you know we have the ability, the drive, we've proved it many times in many ways. Unfortunately, when it comes specifically to EVs, they have another problem, which is not just to do with behavioral change and changing the roads and changing the actual vehicle uh, you know, construction and the manufacturing process and all of that. The other problem is that EVs have to be, uh, have batteries, which is not even a simple problem because the batteries themselves consume and use very harmful materials. Even that is something we could get over. But the largest problem of all is that the batteries need to be charged with electricity. And if you look at the, at the emitters of the world, electricity is number one, transport is number two. So to reduce, to replace number two with number one as the high electricity, which when it is used uh, using coal as it is in India, India uses more than 70% of our electricity is coal. And coal is the very worst thing. It's the number one goal of COP, reduce your dependence on coal. So how does spending millions and billions, maybe trillions of dollars on changing our whole infrastructure to accommodate EVs, if we don't simultaneously take care of the coal aspects, how is it going to help us? It is not going to help us. It would be much more useful to reduce our coal dependence and spend that same money there. It may not make as good headlines, but it would certainly have a much better impact. Going purely by the numbers, the government's numbers, as well as the UN numbers. So that's what I have to say on EVs. <laughs> okay. Um, Would you like to also respond? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Firstly, I have, uh, I was a little um, hassled because I didn't ask, have the question for the first answer, but we've gotten the answer from our trainer. She says that, uh, so EPR is something that um, is very important, that, that EPR that is extended to use responsibility, something that is present in India and it is only with regard to e-waste. So it becomes the responsibility of the producer when it comes to re re removing these toxins and these toxic materials, it becomes the responsibility of the producer and they have their own mechanisms to sort of remove these toxins before they actually send it out for um, say um, recycling or disposal or, or dealing with the ones which cannot dispose. So, that's pretty much in the ambit of the producer. Coming to these, the, the two other questions, I think the, the problem with e-vehicles is apart from the fact that it requires electricity or uh, we haven't done a great job with it is the issue of class. So um, we're talking about e-vehicles, but how many people in India can afford e-vehicles is the question. So do we focus on um, getting electronic vehicles yeah great for certain populations maybe it can work out um, but as uh, pointed out earlier it's it's definitely i mean there is going to be a whole electricity and coal related problem that comes with it so that has its own challenges but even when we talk about a huge section of people cannot afford e-vehicles so what do they do the investment then has to be on two things one creating public transport mechanism and infrastructure that is that can be accessed by all and two creating spaces for non-motorized transportation um, for example cycling is delhi for example a walking city at all no um, so can delhi be redesigned or can 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 we make our cyclists safer that's that's the question so i mean even if you see now about 27 i think 2019 27 to 28 percent of the people who died on roads in accidents were uh, non-motorized transport users. So um, this 
So if, if we do not have walking cities, if we don't have cities where our cyclists are safe, because in India, it's not about elite cycling, it's about, it's, it's very much class. So, uh, so that becomes a very big factor in terms of um, having, I would say, I would call it e-transport and e-transport to me would be good public infrastructure, uh, public transport infrastructure and spaces for NMTs. So that would be my priority if I looked at India's policy. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. We, we sort of run into the next mm -hmm. time slot. I, there's one or two actually very interesting things. Uh, if one, one, you know, sentence responses on that, because it's a very interesting question. One is right to repair as a fundamental right. That is one. And how much of making things mandatory? Because, you know, we have gone to COP and made commitments. Of course, they are, you know, as far away as, uh, you know, the visit to other planets but uh, you know what do you think about those things how how is it feasible for businesses uh, to be able to make all their things recyclable and right to repair as a fundamental right if each of you all uh, sumaira a sentence about that from your side and then Shruti from your side well i think we'll get the kind of products we demand right so if we insist that we that climate is important and that we want things to last and we're willing to pay a little more upfront to make that happen, then we will save the money that we do in demolishing everything, whether it's from the phone to our whole economy and our entire infrastructure, the cost of de demolishing and rebuilding is always more. So it depends what we want. If we want shortcuts, then yeah, we're going to have these shortcuts and we're going to keep paying again and again and polluting. If we want to take a longer view, we have a, we build on a firmer footing in general. That's up to us. Um, I think I completely agree with you. I am in full agreement. I feel like it's, it's about what we prioritize and what we are told to prioritize and what we are conditioned into prioritizing. So if we prioritize climate, if we prioritize a circular economy, if we prioritize um, repair rather than, or repair, recycling and reusing, I think, I think it has to be a, it's, it's a behavioral and cultural, and when I say behavioral, I'm not putting it on people, but rather it's a cultural shift. shift. It's, it has to be within political culture. It has to be, be within corporate and business culture. It has to be with people as well. So it's a, that shift is a whole, almost a societal cultural shift. So that's what, and right to repair should be a fundamental right. <laughs> Anand, if I may just add just one sentence more. Sure. You know, we are spending as a country $1.3 trillion we have announced on new interest, infrastructure. That new infrastructure is all polluting infrastructure. And at the same time, we have asked for $1, million, $1 trillion from developed countries to mitigate climate problems and help us catch up. So where do these figures, the, the, the budget for environment this year is 2000 crores and the budget for building is 100 lakh crores. And we talk of balancing development and environment. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. And that's why my, my answer to all these questions is, it's up to us. If we want to spend 100 lakh crores on destroying the environment and 2,000 crores on saving it, that's what we're going to get. I think, uh, you know, the summarization of both of what you said is fantastic, you know. Uh, and I think I'd like also like to point out what Mandvi has mentioned uh, that, uh, and again, that resonates with what Sumaira said is we get what we ask for. So if we uh, are demand for more public transportation, electric vehicles, rather than elect if we say electric buses, electric mass transportation, uh, then the infrastructure will not be coastal roads or, you know, private transportation based uh, facilities. If we asked for longer recyclability or longer life spans, life cycles of products and durability, then we will not want to change our products every two years, three years, or those kind of things. So, if, if putting those kinds of demands, if it's the uh, bring going to bring about that change. So, yeah, efficiency, uh, durability. I think that's something again we have to learn from nature. Uh, you know, I I keep going back to that because that's my core and my root. And uh, thank you so much, Sumaira. Thank you so much, Switi. And uh, I think this was a womanly empowering session for us that, uh, 
you know, you really uh, are leading the path in that. Thank you for the fantastic work that you're doing. Thank so thanks. You. Thank you.